to the worship gathering at Coda this morning. Will you stand with me as we worship this morning? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for all you do for us. We thank you for your presence here this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. This morning, Father, just be with us. Be with the message. Be with each person that's here. Father, we love you, and we give you the honor and the praise and the glory for it all. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worthy 
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above and every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for
Welcome to Church of the Apostle. My name is Michael, and today's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. This can be found in the Blue Bible in front of you on page 1262. If you need a Bible or you know someone that needs a Bible, please feel free to take one with you today as you leave. Again, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, page 1262. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice when so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Andy. If you are 
a guest with us. JP is enjoying, uh, him and his family are enjoying a vacation, uh, celebrating Asher's uh, recent graduation from high school. So, uh, so that's good for them, uh, but that means uh, I get the privilege of preaching this morning and thankful for that. So uh, let's open up in a word of prayer and then uh, we will uh, jump into our text this morning. Father God, we come before you this morning and want to just pause as we contemplate this passage and what uh, you are saying to us through the Apostle Peter, um, as we think about the context of the folks that Peter was writing to, but then we see this in our own life, in our own context. God, I pray that by your spirit that you would give us eyes to see, um, that we would receive your word, that you would um, show us how this applies to to our life, what this means for us as disciples of Jesus, what it is that we should expect as followers of Christ. And God, I pray that in all of this, that our hearts are enlarged and enriched and our vision of you is greater and grander. And um, Lord, that you are glorified in all that is said and done. Uh, And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have been uh, reading this book. It's called Resilient Faith. I would recommend it to anyone who wants to pick it up. It's by a guy named Jerry Steltzer. And basically, the premise of the book is he's, kinda, he's asking this question. He's asking, essentially, the question, what shaped the early church? What is it that formed the early church? What is it that allowed them to be so effective in their context and in their time as making disciples? And at the end of the book, he kind of summarizes all of it in, in, into this paragraph. He says, now, as in then, as then, the church needs disciples to trust in and confess that Jesus is Lord and to try to live accordingly, who orient their lives around the worship of the triune God and understand the Christian story is their story, who view themselves as new creations in Christ and as members of a global community of faith, and who strive to imitate Jesus in all areas of life, serve the least of these and steward their resources as if everything belongs to God, which of course it does. Nothing short of a change of church culture will suffice. From a culture of entertainment, politics, personality, and programs to a culture of discipleship. The story of the early Christians reminds us that faithful Christians have gone before us bearing witness to the truth of Christianity, the power of the gospel, and the high calling of discipleship. Calling across the centuries, those early Christians, they tell us that it is possible now, just as it was then, to live as faithful followers of Jesus the Lord. In a culture that does not approve of it, and does not reward it. That idea at the end where he says bearing witness to the truth of Christianity grabbed my attention because that's essentially what this passage that Peter's talking about is about. And so I began to ask myself the question, what would that look like or what does that look like to bear witness to the truth of Christianity and to the power of the gospel and to the high calling of discipleship What does it look like to do that in a culture that does not approve of that, has no time for that, and does not reward it? What does it look like to bear witness to Jesus as an educator? What does it look like to bear witness to Jesus as someone who works in healthcare? What does it look like to bear witness to Jesus in my home or in my neighborhood? or at the gym, or at my kid's sporting event? What does it look like to bear witness to Jesus as a business person, or as a homemaker? What does it look like for me, in my context, to bear witness for Jesus? And as I thought about that, the the thought of allegiance came to my mind, and that's where I want to start is this idea of allegiance. And so before we jump into our text, go with me up to chapter 3 and look at verse 15. Peter starts halfway through chapter 3, and he's he's talking about we're on the tail end of this 
this uh, part of his discourse that he's talking about here. And he says something very incredibly important as we think about what it means to bear witness to Jesus. He says in chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. That is, the, that is at the very core of what it means to bear witness to Jesus. Why is that? It's because in order to bear witness to Jesus, it does not begin out there in the world. It begins in here in our heart. That's where it begins. Bearing witness to the name of Jesus begins in our heart. It's, it does not start with what I do in the world. It does not start with what I say to my neighbors. It starts to, with what I treasure most. It starts with where is my allegiance? Who has my allegiance? The allegiance of my heart and the allegiance of my life. You see, throughout Scripture, the idea of heart is like the, the engine of our life. It's what, it's what runs our life. It's, it's the core of who we are. And so whatever we set our heart on, everything else in our heart orients around that. So before we think about what it means to be a witness into, in the world, we must first stop and ask, where is the allegiance of my own heart? Above all the other things that I love, above all the other things that I'm passionate about and all the other things that that I desire and want in life above all of that am I oriented around Jesus is he the deepest joy of my life is he the one that I pursue is he the center of my life that everything else in my life orients around or is my allegiance to some other story some lesser story some alternative narrative you see, everything that it means to bear witness to, to Jesus must begin and end with that question. Where is my allegiance? What is it that captivates my heart? Because where your allegiance is, that shapes your identity. And where you find your identity shapes your activity in the world. Your activity with the things in which you speak and the things that you give your time to and your priorities and your values, all of it begins with what has your allegiance, which then flows out into who you are, which is your identity. And then out of that flows how you live your activity. All of it begins with what has your allegiance. And so is your allegiance Jesus Christ primarily? Because if it is, if your allegiance is to him, then that means we must orient our lives around his priorities and his practices and his habits of giving ourselves to the things that matter to him, that are important to him. And if we endure to live in the way of Jesus, then we are going to live in such a way that we are doing good to our neighbors, even those who do not like us, and we are to do good even to our enemies to love our enemies but all of that a life like that all of that depends and starts with this confession it begins with understanding and, and seeing the reality that my heart is more divided and more ugly than I than I want to admit this is why I love to gather with God's people on Sunday this is why I need to gather in what we call missional community with God's people on a regular basis. This is why I must preach the gospel to myself over and over and over again. Because I don't wake up thinking automatically with my allegiance to Jesus completely. I don't wake up like that every morning. I don't go throughout the day with my allegiance to Jesus I go out throughout the day with my allegiance. My allegiance wants to be to Andy and to Andy's kingdom. I wake up like that. I go throughout the day in circumstances or whatever else is about Andy and his kingdom. And so I must preach the gospel to myself over and over if my, if my allegiance is going to be to Jesus and to him alone. Because my heart is divided, my allegiance is divided, and it needs to be centered on Jesus. And so bearing witness to Jesus begins with this question, what has my primary allegiance? Who has my primary allegiance? And so we go forward with confession, and we go forward with repentance. And so this morning, as we think about our allegiance, I want to think about it in the context of what Peter is calling us to, what Peter is preparing us for as followers of Jesus. And so let's just kind of get the big picture of this context as we move into our passage specifically this morning. 
Look at, start up at chapter 3, verse 13. I want you to see this pattern, this theme that Peter is talking about in this entire section. In chapter 3, verse 13, this is what he says. He says, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for doing what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. And look at verse 17. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wills, than for doing evil. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And then in our passage this morning in, in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial which comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's suffering. Do you hear the language of suffering repeatedly in that passage? This language of fiery trial for those who are followers of Jesus. Now Peter here is not talking about suffering uh, in general, he's not speaking of all kinds of suffering. He's not talking about <clears throat> the suffering that we endure because of the fall and, and the brokenness of the world. That's not, he's not speaking on that. He's not speaking about the suffering that we cause by our own evil deeds and our own sin. That's not where he's focusing. He's focusing here on the kind of suffering that comes when our allegiance is to Jesus and we seek to do good. He's talking about the kind of suffering that comes when we're living for and speaking for and aligning our lives with the way of Jesus. He's talking about the kind of suffering that comes when we are bearing witness for Christ. That's the suffering he's talking about. Peter calls it here suffering for righteousness sake. Now there, there's a lot that can be said about suffering. There's a lot of <clears throat> passages and verses throughout the Bible that addresses the various forms of suffering. We can find that throughout the scripture. But here, what Peter is doing is he's showing us how to bear witness to Jesus when there is pressure and even persecution. And there are three things I want to draw out <clears throat> from our text this morning that Peter is highlighting. The first is expect suffering. As a follower of Jesus... Expect suffering. Secondly, rejoice in suffering's work. And third, stay patient in suffering. So let's look at the first thing. Expect suffering. Don't be surprised by it, he says. Go back with me again up to chapter 3, verse 13. Peter begins this whole section with this question. He says, how is there, who is there, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Doing good to your neighbors, blessing and, and serving and pouring yourself out for them and stewarding your resources and caring for others. Living a Christ-like good works in the world and, and motivated by this compassion, this Christ-like compassion for the world. A general rule of thumb is that things will go well. That's a general rule of thumb. <clears throat> Meaning that your co-workers and your friends... And your family members, when you do good to them, generally, they appreciate that. Most of the time. If we live generously, if we seek to bless others, if we look to honor others, if we look for ways in which we can serve, generally, what Peter is saying, generally, in that case, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for good works? Because generally, when we seek to do good to others, things go well. Except for when they do not. Except for when they don't. If you look at verse 14, that's what that but is right there at the beginning of verse 14 of chapter 3. When he says, But even if you do suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. What is Peter doing? Peter is preparing the church and he's preparing us for the possibility, the very real possibility that you'll actually suffer for doing what is right. That things will not go well for you. You might suffer for doing good. You might even suffer for righteousness sake. He is preparing us in advance before we begin to feel the pressure and before we experience the harm of the probability that you will suffer as a follower of Jesus. 
And that's largely what our, what our text in chapter 4, verse 12 through 19 is about. So look with me in chapter 12, or chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> Peter writes, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery trial as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be, su- don't be surprised, he says. If, if suffering comes, if, it, like, like it's strange, like it shouldn't be there. Now, if you simply watch the life of Christ, and if you simply follow through the life of Christ and you listen to the things that he says, his main metaphor of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to take up your cross and follow him. That is his main metaphor of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so it would be hard to come away from a vision of Christianity then that does not include suffering. Jesus, after all, is the suffering servant. That is who he is. And so if we're going to take Jesus seriously, and if we're going to take his life as a pattern for our own life, and if we're going to take his teachings as authoritative, then Christianity should come with a giant neon sign that says suffering likely. It's going to happen if you're a follower of Jesus. But... Unfortunately, we approach it like iTunes when you sign up for iTunes. What do you do when you sign up for iTunes? You just scroll all the way down to the bottom and you click agree. You never read the fine print that says this is going to cost you. You're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Scroll, click. That's, that's a lot of times how we think and how we enter into this Christian life. But Peter here is preparing us. That suffering for righteousness' sake is normal. The problem for, I think, for most of us as I thought about this, particularly in the West, particularly in the United States, is that we've heard a gospel often mingled with the American dream. A gospel that says, just add Jesus to your life and that guarantees blessing. Just put Jesus in your life and that guarantees that you're going to prosper and all these good things are going to happen to you and you're going to have all of this stuff. Just just add Jesus to your life and these things will take place. The idea that God is going to make make your life go well. Just trust Jesus and he will bless your life and all of this stuff. Just believe in Jesus and everything will go well. God loves you after all and has a wonderful plan for your life, which... It's true, sort of, but right after Peter writes this passage, or this letter, shortly after that, Christians started being taken into the Roman Colosseum, and lions were let loose, and they would rip the Christians apart because of their faith in front of spectators who cheered it on, and as I thought about that, I remembered this picture that Cap captures this very well. God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Here's here's what I want us to understand, is that historically and globally for the norm for Christians, although there are seasons of reprieve, but globally and historically the norm for Christians is pressure. Most Christians around the world and historically have lived under pressure, provocation, and persecution. In fact, the statistics of today, this is today, there are some 360 million Christians worldwide who live in nations of high levels of persecution and discrimination. That's one out of like every seven Christians in the world who live under the threat of persecution, high levels of persecution. Discrimination. That's today. Last year, 5,600 Christians were killed just because of their faith. That doesn't include those who were abused. It doesn't include those who were falsely accused and imprisoned. It doesn't include those who were sold off into slavery. Last year, 5,600 estimated were killed because of their faith. That is the normal around the world that Christians face. 
And Peter says, don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. So let me ask you this as we kind of think about this. How does your picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus begin to shift if you start with this assumption that Peter has? If you begin with this reality, yes, following Jesus, there is joy and there's life satisfying satisfaction and there's this fulfillment in Christ. And there's also suffering in following Jesus. How does that assumption that Peter has challenge or change your picture of what it means to follow Jesus? Have you ever been like walking down the street, maybe your neighborhood or whatever, and you're walking along and all of a sudden you hear this ferocious animal barking and charging you, a dog? Have you ever had that experience? Maybe they're behind a fence or on a leash or whatever. You don't realize that at first. You're just kind of walking along doing your thing. And all of a sudden you look up and this dog is wanting to tear your head off. Have you ever had that experience? Am I the only one who's ever had that experience? Do you all know what that's like? When, you're, when you don't expect it to happen, what happens? You don't expect it, you're surprised by it, and you're gripped with fear, like this thing's going to kill me, right? Now, if you know that that's going to happen because you've walked down that road before, you're kind of anticipating, you know what house it is, you know what that dog is, you can kind of prepare yourself, and so as it comes and the dog is running at you, charging at you, what happens? Well, you're not filled with fear, you know that he's behind a fence, he's not going to get you, you just kind of go along your way, but why? Because you're anticipating it. You know that it's coming. You know that, it's, that that is going to happen. When, we are, when it's unexpected and we're unprepared and we're surprised by it, we're gripped with fear. But if there's expectation of it and prepared for it, we're ready for that to happen. I think sometimes the hardest thing about suffering is that we just aren't ready for it. We aren't expecting it. And when we are surprised by it, it throws us off and it puts this in as this tailspin. And so what I'm asking is, what is it that we actually expect as followers of the suffering servant? Our vision of what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Christ, what is it that we expect when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me? What is our vision of that? If we want to be a follower of Jesus, Peter says, if you have your allegiance to Christ, if you orient your life around his priorities and his values and the customs of his kingdom, kingdom minded, then you will intend to do good for others. You will intend to serve others and to seek peace. You will intend to do that. But most often, inevitably, Peter says, you will eventually suffer in some form or in some fashion at some time or another because bearing witness to Christ is almost always costly. And so there are at some measure of loss and there will be some measure of suffering that you will endure and there will be some measure of slander and reviling and loss of reputation and loss of resources and at some point it may cost you the advancement in your career and it may cost you your wealth and it may cost you your power and your significance and you may feel ostracized because of it. And Jesus seeking to bear witness to Christ in all of life You will experience suffering in some form or some fashion. At some level, you will experience that as a follower of Jesus. And so that's the first point, suffering likely. But Peter wants us to not just be surprised, to to not, not be surprised by suffering. He doesn't just want us to understand that we should we should know that suffering is going to happen as a follower of Jesus. But he actually says here that we can rejoice in the midst of suffering. Rejoice in suffering's work. Look, again, go back one more time, back up to chapter 3, verse 14. Peter says, it seems, he seems to be saying here that there's a blessing in suffering. He says, even if you suffer for righteousness, righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Now, in the Greek, it's a statement of fact. He says, it actually says, you are blessed. Jesus says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount, does he not? When he says, blessed are you when you suffer for righteousness sake. And then if you look in our passage this morning in verse 13 and 14, Peter says, but rejoice in so far as you share in the sufferings of Christ. I, I think what Peter's trying to get at is he wants us to see that God is at work in it. Even when it is hard and even when it is painful and even when we suffer loss, Peter wants us to see that God is doing a good work in the midst of our suffering. Verse 12, beloved, 
Do not be surprised when this fiery trial comes upon you to test you. Do you see that in that verse? This kind of suffering, this fiery trial that Peter is talking about is not without purpose. It comes to you to test you. The fiery trial that he's talking about is this purifying fire. It is a fire of refinement. Paul, or Peter uses the same imagery at the very beginning of this epistle in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, when he talks about this fiery trial, this suffering tests the genuineness of your faith. It's this picture of refining metal where you have some ore that has mixed metals in it. Yes, there's gold there, but there's some other dross. There's some other metals mixed in that. So what is it that you do? You heat it up. You put it into a furnace, and you melt it down. And what that does is it burns away the dross, and it purifies the gold. The fiery trial burns away the dross, the mixed metal, and it purifies the gold that is there. Tim Keller talks about this. He says this kind of suffering in three ways, this refining act, leads us to rejoicing in three ways. The first way is that rejoice or suffering will show us what we are really trusting in. That's part of God's intent or design, his purpose, to reveal what we really are trusting in. Suffering reveals the division of our allegiance. Suffering reveals the idols of our heart. Suffering reveals that our heart is more divided than we ever thought it was. Outside of the fire, I can live with my allegiance to Jesus and my allegiance to my own kingdom and not even know it. But inside the fire, my true allegiance will come to the surface very quickly when I'm inside the fire. That's what it does. It reveals the allegiance of our heart. Suddenly I see in the fire where my allegiance is. Outside the fire I can live with undivided, with divided allegiance and not even be aware of it. And the truth is we don't even know how much our career or our reputation or our financial stability, how centered that is with our allegiance until it is threatened. When those things are threatened, if bearing witness to Christ jeopardizes my career, I will discover very quickly where my allegiance lies with my career. When it is threatened, I will discover quickly the idol of my heart. We don't know how much we find our worth and our value and our significance in our parenting or our parenting skills until that is threatened. When we say, no, we're not going that way or we're not being involved in that thing, and then people begin to question our decision. And they say, you're just overbearing or you're just weird or you're judgy or that's just dumb. Why do you do that? It's not until our, our parenting is threatened that we begin to see the idol of our own heart. And suddenly, our worth and our identity that we have built up as a good parent, when that is threatened, then the allegiance of our heart is exposed and we feel the tension. And this is what suffering does. Suffering reveals the allegiance of our heart. It shows what it is that we're really trusting in. But secondly, suffering shows the vanity of what we trust in. Part of the design behind this fiery trial that Peter is talking about here is to reveal that what we are trusting in, it can't hold us. It can't deliver what it promises. Our career can't give us the deep and lasting satisfaction, and our parenting skills cannot secure the wealth or the the value and the worth that we desire. When we suffer, when, we, when those things are threatened or lost, and we, f- we begin to feel the vanity of that, we feel the loss, and we feel the despair that comes, and the rejection that comes, and we feel those things. And to the degree, to the degree that we trust in, and hope in, and put our identity in these things, to the degree that we give our allegiance to these things, when they are threatened, they will leave us empty, They will leave us exhausted, and they will leave us unfulfilled because they cannot give us the joy and the life and the significance that they promise to give. They can't give it. 
And so suffering reveals the allegiances of our heart, the idols of our heart, but then it shows the vanity of those things that we were trusting in, that they cannot fulfill what we're looking for them to fulfill, that only Christ can do that. But the third thing, if we stick through it, if we trust God in it, if we allow suffering to have its good work in us, the suffering that comes with bearing witness to the name of Christ, then it will bring us into a deeper and truer uh, understanding and and experience and knowledge of who God is as he burns out those idols of our heart, as he burns away the dross that divides our allegiance to Christ. When we bear witness to Christ, It is costly. And when that cost comes and it challenges other things that we love and and orient our life around, we have a choice in that moment. We have a choice. Will we grasp on to those things? Will we double down? Will we try to secure our career or our reputation or our control or our significance or our comfort? Will we hold tightly to these things or will we begin to see the emptiness of what they are and turn to the only one who can truly hold us, the one who is faithful, the one who gave his life on our behalf? And I think this is what Peter is getting at when he, verse 17 through 19, when he begins to talk about this idea of judgment. He says, for It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, the people of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel of God? And then he kind of uses a parable here, or a a proverb here. And if the righteousness, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Peter is talking about at final judgment all their heart's alliances, or uh, uh, all that the heart uh, loves will be made bare. The allegiances of the heart, all of them will be seen. But what he's talking about here, for the follower of Jesus, God is already at work doing that in our heart now. He's already working to make those things bare. And so Peter here is not talking about condemnation. When he talks about judgment here in the context of the believer, he's not talking about judgment. Uh, condemnation. He's talking about purification, this judgment of purification. He's speaking about God's judgment that purifies and refines his people and set his people free, revealing the allegiances of our heart, purifying like gold our faith, and preparing us for the end when we will be made whole. This is Peter's point. Not only that we should not be surprised by it, but that we actually have good reason to rejoice in it. There's joy in suffering for righteousness' sake and sharing in the sufferings of Christ now because what that is doing in us now is preparing us to share in the glory of Christ in the end. That's what he's talking about here. And so Peter is telling us that God is, and this is what I want us to understand, is that God is not absent in our suffering that comes when we're bearing witness to Christ. Suffering is not a sign that God has forgotten his church or forsaken his people. Suffering is actually evidence that God is doing a good work in his people. Paul Tripp in his book, How People Change, he says, God is taking us where we don't want to go in order to produce in us what cannot be produced in any other way. God is refining and beautifying his church, his people. He is using our suffering to make us whole and to make us holy. He is setting us free. He's uniting our heart and centering our allegiances on Jesus. And in light of that, in light of that understanding of what Peter's talking about in this suffering, we have good reason to rejoice when suffering comes insofar as we suffer with Christ. And on that day, and on that day when we see Christ when all things are restored to disciples, they just prioritize discipleship to Jesus. They went about life with the priority of the hard and humble work of patience in that work. The pressure rose, the persecution intensified, and they kept on walking with Jesus. And so what does that look like for us as we close, as we land this plane? What does it look like for us in our context, in a culture that does not tolerate Christ, does not have time for discipleship or any of those things, what does it look like? Well, Peter says, leaves us with three things. Verse 16, he says, do not be ashamed. 
do not be ashamed. When you experience reviling, do not be ashamed. When you experience rejection and, and you experience pressure, don't be ashamed. When the awkwardness of relationships are there and there's this embarrassment or this discomfort, when you experience loss and harm and ridicule, don't be ashamed. It is not a sign of God's absence. Secondly, he says, keep doing good in verse 19. The most basic kingdom ethic is love your enemies. Jesus tells us that. Love not just the people who are nice to you and do nice things to you and the people that you like. But love the people who hate you. Love those who are against you. That's why I think he puts in, inserts here, verse 15, where he says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Don't suffer because you murder people. Don't let that be the reason why you suffer. Don't suffer because you are a thief. Why does he say this? I think he says this because we're so often tempted to respond in these kinds of ways when we experience pressure and persecution. We want to dish it back out. We want to retaliate when people do us wrong. We want to murder, so to speak. You murder us, we'll take up the sword. You steal our stuff, we will take your stuff. You do us evil, we will repay in like kind. That is the temptation of our heart. We want to respond in the way in which we are attacked. And so these are all opposite of the way of Jesus, and they're the temptation of our heart. And so the way of Jesus is to keep serving and keep blessing and keep loving and being gentle and respectful and kind and continue praying and giving and doing good even to those who hate you and do evil to you. And so don't be ashamed. Keep doing good. And then finally, in verse 19, he says, entrust your soul to the faithful creator. Entrust your soul to the faithful creator. The God that you trust knows suffering. He's acquainted with suffering. He understands it. Because Jesus came and he suffered on our behalf. He knows what it's like to be reviled. He knows what it's like to be written. Your life is in his hands. You can rest in the sovereign care of your, of your God. The sovereign care of your God. He is good and he is faithful and he is just. And just as he rose Jesus from the dead, he will rise, raise you up as well. And so as we live bearing witness to Jesus, don't be surprised when you begin to experience pressure. And you begin to experience forms of persecution or rejection or ridicule or revile. In some measure, to some degree, and in some form at some point. Rather, lean into it. Because God is doing a good work in you through it. Learn to rejoice, not in the suffering itself, but in the good work that God is doing through the suffering. And then live without shame. Continue to do good while entrusting your soul to the sovereign care of our faithful creator. In a world and in a culture that rejects Jesus, rejects the ways of Jesus, and rejects the people of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning, and as we deal with this idea of suffering, this is not an easy topic. We're not to look for suffering. We aren't to be those who enjoy the experience of suffering and look to suffer and say, look at me, look how much I have suffered. That is not the call in which Peter gives. But Father, as we seek to be faithful followers of Jesus, we will be confronted. There will be times where hard decisions will be made. There will be times when we will be rejected and reviled. So God, I pray that in those moments that we do not shrink back in fear, that we do not shrink back in shame or disgrace, but that we stand firm in trusting our souls to our faithful creator and that we continue to do good to others, even to those 
would do harm to us so that in that we continue to bear witness to Christ. God, may we be that kind of a people for your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we come to the table this morning, I just want to invite you uh, to join us as we celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as we remember that through communion. And so we have two tables here. We'll have um, folks here at either one serving you guys. And then we have one back here that you can serve yourself. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you have questions, I want to encourage you to spend some time praying. We got some prayers, uh, some questions there on the back of the little card in the Bible. Spend some time doing that. I would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus, if that is you. If you are here and you are a follower of Jesus, then we invite you to join us as we celebrate who Christ is, as we're reminded once again of the gospel. And before we go to the table, I want to read from, again, chapter 3, verse 18. Chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, Peter tells us, For Christ also suffered once for our sins the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus, for Jesus to be faithful to the mission in which he came, to be faithful to his Father, meant suffering. That's what it meant. It cost him his life to save us. It cost him his life to rescue us. To save us meant giving up his life. The righteous one suffered for the unrighteous in order to bring us to God. And as we come to the table, we come as people who have been suffered for. Yes, we're called that we will suffer as followers of Christ. But we come first as people who have been suffered for. Not just people who are called to suffer but people for whom God himself chose to suffer in order to have. And so as we come, I invite you to come. I invite you to take a piece of the bread and to dip it into the cup, the bread representing the righteousness of Christ, his life in which he lived for us that we cannot live for ourselves, the cup representing the blood of Christ shed for our sins, dying the death that we deserve. And so as we do that, as we come remembering who Christ is and what he has done for us and the penalty that he has paid for us, for our sins and for our forgiveness. And so I ask you to come, to come soberly. Come recognizing that as you partake in the bread and in the cup, that you are partaking in this great love that God has for you, this sacrificial love, but you're also partaking, coming fully aware and signing up that you are following the, ser- the suffering servant, that you are his disciple. So come soberly. Come receive. Come without shame. Come entrusting your soul to the faithful creator and the sovereign care of our Father in heaven. Christ who laid down his life for us. So as the Spirit moves you, come, take of the bread and take of the cup and give thanks. strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With the love that casts out fear 
you're working in our way. Sanctifying us and when beyond our understanding, and you're teaching us to trust, your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us, and you're with us in the fire the flood and you're faithful forever and perfect in love you are sovereign over us wisdom unimagined stand and lift your voice who could understand your ways reigning high above the heavens reaching down in endless grace you're the lifter people who are quite honestly fragile and the things that Peter says in this pastoral care seeking to encourage us in the reality of, of hard things 
Father, we are a people who run from suffering. We are a people who try to avoid it at every turn. And yet, as your people, as disciples of Christ, it is inevitable that we will have to endure. But God, we are grateful and thankful that we do not endure in our own strength, by our own power, but we have our faithful creator who sustains us by the spirit of God who dwells in us and who empowers us and who encourages us and who strengthens us. And so God, help us to press in to you. When those moments come, help us not to shrink back in fear and in shame, but to stand on the promises of God, to stand firm and to learn to rejoice in what you have called us and who you've called us to be. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, now, Molly has several announcements this morning. I say several. I don't know. Several. several? All right. I'm going to... Uh, we're going to give her the floor. Hey, guys. Um, my name is Molly Owens. Um, I'm actually going to read all these announcements right off my phone. You know why? Because I have the Church Center app. Um, seriously, truly, uh, the things I'm about to say, if you do download the Church Center app, we've talked about this the last few weeks, there's a couple of flyers posted around, and then there's flyers out there on the welcome table that have little QR code. If you're not into QR codes, it gives you the actual web address. Um, and it gives you the option of downloading the Apple version or the Android version, um, Google Play, whatever. Um, but this really is going to be helpful, guys. And I know everybody's like, oh, another app. It's really going to be where, like, all our announcements are, our sign-ups. Sign-ups leads me to, um, we've been talking about this one a little bit, too, June 8th. Um, is going to be, it's a Saturday, um, we're going to be having an outreach event at Veterans Memorial Pool. And we're doing this a little bit differently than we've done in the past. So it's just like an open time when the community can go to the pool. What we're going to do is we're going to show up and we are paying for anyone who comes from 12 to 2 from CODA, but also anyone who shows up from the community who's just happened to, going the, happened to go to the pool that day, we're going to pay for their admission. We're also going to have hot dogs and chips and stuff like that. So... If you are interested in coming, um, we'd love to have you there. We also need a couple people just to help grow hot dogs and stuff like that. Um, you can sign up in the app. There's a place to do sign-ups, and then that helps us kind of get a head count and also helps us know it, how many people we have that are willing to help us with uh, just grilling the hot dogs, getting them set out or whatever. So um, that is June 8th um, from 12 to 2. And again, sign up in the app. Um, the other two things are actually, I didn't do them chronologically because I wanted to connect those two announcements. The other two things are happening June 2nd, which is next Sunday. Next Sunday, um, we always kind of have first Sunday snacks, you know that. We're going to do some special snacks kind of kick off to summer. Um, so the sweet hospitality ladies are doing, we're going to do like an ice cream bar, so it'll be really fun. And it's not just for kids, it's for everybody. Um, also, so feel free to stay for that. Also, um, we try to do this every summer. We've purchased, um, a devotional. Um, for all the Coda Kid families to take, uh, to use just with your family through the summer or even outside of the summer. Um, I got the Louis Giglio devotional. We have it as a family. Um, it's How Great Is Our God and it's devotions on God and how we see God in science. Um, and so appropriate for a wide range of ages. So we'll have those available next week. And lastly, um, Ben Barrett, who works here, he's actually with the youth right now, um, he has a connection um, with a, a group that looks at foster care in Dawson County. Um, these are, there was a whole list of statistics, I'm only going to give you two, but these are pretty uh, thought-provoking. There are currently four foster families in Dawson County. There's no availability for, like, that's it, they're maxed out, four families. There are 58 children that have had to go outside of Dawson County for placement because there is nowhere in Dawson County for them to go. So they're having to leave the county where they're from in order to get foster care. If you would like any information on how you can help out with foster care, and that's not just being a foster family, but just anything, there is gonna be um, an informational meeting at Harmony Baptist Church, June 2nd at 5.30. So that's next Sunday um, in the evening. Um, so if you've got questions about that, you can, honestly, uh, if you have questions about anything, I'm gonna start trying to say this. 
Email info at codachurch.com if you've got questions, and that comes to me, and then I can get it to the right person. If you're like, I don't know who Ben Barrett is, if you email that, then I can forward those emails to the right person. But uh, that's kind of the general email if you've ever got questions about anything. But um, those are announcements. Oh, I'll be over here on the side if you do have any questions about the app. If you have any issues, technical issues, you need, need help, I'll stand here over on the side in case you need help with that. You know how I said the heart is the engine that all of your rest of your life uh, orients around? Molly is the engine that all of CODA orients around, so <laughs> we're thankful for all that she does. Uh, well, stand with me for our benediction. I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, Therefore, beloved brothers and sisters, stand, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Peace of the Lord always be with you. And also with you.